vam Iva Čvorović Hedinja, Isidora Jankov and Viktor Adović from Belgrade University, Deep Learning Engines for LSST Agent Photometric Variation Mapping. So please, Iva. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Iva Čvorović Hajdinjak, and uh, I am uh, a first year PhD student at Belgrade University. Uh, my colleague Isidora Jankov and I will present uh, the latest results of the research which our team is currently working on. Uh, exploring transient optical sky is among uh, four Rubin Observatory LSST key science drivers. We are motivated by the ETHOS LSST science opportunity number 14, which enables harnessing LSST light curves of Arctic galactic nuclei for photometric reverberation mapping. Our goal is to build a deep learning engine, uh, DLE, for light curve non-parametric modeling and to implement the photo reverberation mapping procedure to respond to the observing strategy of LSST. Our task is twofold. In DLE1, we have implemented a conditional neural process for non-parametric modeling uh, of AGN light curves. Learned light curves will improve time lag determination as a goal of photo RM, but also help in transient fueling event detection. In DLE2, we have developed Python code for extraction of periodicities and time lags for photometric AGN light curves. Photometric light curves trace uh, both continuum and line variability together, and therefore uh, classic cross-correlation analysis becomes uh, unsuitable for LSST light curves. This new tool for photo RM is based on the formalism by Chalushi and Daniel. Both DLEs will be adaptable for light curves of other types of objects and tested on LSST data previews. I will now introduce you to the Deep Learning Engine 1, in which we uh, uh, attempted to build, a, uh, uh, to build and uh, determine the applicability of neural network on active galactic nuclei light curve model. So AGN uh, light curves are uh, sparse, gapped, and irregular with random flares, uh, non-linear, and st stochastic stru structure. All of these features make them extremely difficult to model and analyze. In order to determine underlying properties of light curve source, such as time lags or possible periodicities, which could imply binary systems, we have attempted to model available data as a means to pre-process it and prepare it for further analysis. Modeling of light curves could be done via, uh, for example, damped random walk or Gaussian processes with different, different kernels or autoencoders, which, uh, which were explained in the previous talks on Monday and Tuesday. In our deep learning engine, we present another tool for this task, a conditional neural process. And the reason why we examine the applicability of this uh, particular method is the stochastic nature of AGN data and the fact that CMP incorporates the ideas from Gaussian process into a neural network training regime. In this research, we have processed 153 optical light curves from All Sky Automated Survey for Supernova Telescope detected in the first nine months of All Sky uh, Survey collected uh, by the Burst Alert Telescope. Each object has uh, between 100 and 600 data points, as you can see in uh, this histogram on the left. Uh, and we have tested our DLEs with uh, this uh, data sample because these objects make a good representation of homogeneous uniform data from 80% of the sky with uh, irregular density of observations uh, with gaps, uh, flares, and possible quasi-periodic oscillations. These uh, objects also uh, cover up to 5.5 years, which make them significant uh, in context of length, considering that LSST time baseline will cover a 10 year long period. So basically twice the period which we have tested with our sample. Uh, deep learning uh, offers a way uh, uh, to model nonlinear behavior and neural networks have shown good results in modeling stochastic data. 
uh, building on previous tools based on Gaussian processes uh, for uh, AGN light curve analysis and modeling, we have developed CMP as supervised training in attempt to approximate function given a finite set of observations. This is the first attempt to examine applicability of conditional neural process on AGN light curve models. I will now uh, try to uh, ex briefly explain a uh, conditional neural process in general. So basically we have a task where we have some unknown function that is this blue line. And uh, we, are, uh, we have some observations, X's and Y's along this line, those red dots. And in addition to that, we also have uh, some training points on the X axis in which we want to find the values for Y. We're going to pass all of these context points, red dots, through an encoder to generate these individual representations, Rs. And then we are going to aggregate them in order to get this unique representation. So this unique R is meant to have all the information of the blue uh, curve that we have obtained with these few observations. We then combine this uh, unique rep uh, representation with our target points, XD, and pass it to uh, a decoder and the decoder will output mean and variance of probability distribution. We use this mean and variance to calculate log probability of predicted values, uh, uh, predicted Y values. And then we use this log probability to back propagate in order to update parameters of our model uh, in the next iteration step. And so that is uh, the general idea. Uh, in our specific case, we have, uh, so we also have some input data, data axes and Ys. Axes in our case uh, is uh, time, uh, our time in modified Julian date, and Ys are measured flux in Miliansky. Our task is essentially to try to find the values of flux in the moments of time where we have, for example, uh, uh, gaps in our observations in order to obtain a, a realistic and continuous representation of our light curve so that we can prepare it for succeeding analysis. We are first going to divide our data set into uh, context points and target. We can see the context set ON is passed uh, through uh, an encoder represented as function age in this picture on the left. Uh, encoder is a multi-layer perception neural network um, and it calculates functions RE for each context point. So for example, we can understand that R1 uh, will be sort of representation of possible function that is equal to Y1 in the moment X1. Aggregator combines all these representations, these uh, R1, and 2 and 3 in the picture, into one. In our case, uh, we have just taken their mean value. And, and this uh, unique representation is passed through decoder along with the uh, target values uh, XD. Decoder represented uh, with G in the graph on the left uh, is also a multi-layer uh, perception neural network. And it calculates predictions for each target value and outputs mean and various variance for predicted distribution. So our neural network architecture consists of two multi-layer perception neural uh, networks uh, and an aggregator. For encoder, we have used five-layer MLP and for the decoder, three-layer MLP. And, and finally, here are some results. Uh, in this uh, animation, we can see an example of learning process. This is an animation of training process for NGC 5548 age beta light curve, which has been trained with 25,000 iterations. Dark blue dots are actual measured values of flux. Those would be our context points. Uh, green, uh, light green dots represent predicted values in target points. Uh, light green shaded uh, band is confidence uh, interval, which reduces after each iteration step. We can see how after uh, every 1000 iterations, conditional neural process becomes more accurate in modeling our data. Uh, these are some uh, representative examples of our uh, learned curves after 300,000 iterations. In these results, we can see uh, how, uh, most, how most of uh, these um, uh, data sets are very difficult to model and each, has, uh, each of these curves has a different structure. So we can observe how our tool 
that our tool deals with various features uh, of input data set. For example, in the first row, on the first plot, there is a big slope uh, with 200 days gap. In the second plot, there is almost a constant ascending gradient. Uh, in the second row, the first plot for uh, 3C382 shows a gradient change from ascending to descending. While uh, in the case of Feral 9, we have two consequent dips with extreme gradient change in 400 days. <clears throat> As we can see, our model is able to properly learn rapid variations, but with considerable number of iterations. In these examples, we can see how gaps are learned with our model. In the first plot, we can see a very complex structure with low density of observations in the first 1,000 days, as opposed to the last 1,000 days, which are very tightly observed with visible flares and successive peaks. The second plot for Mercarian 509 shows, again, a sequential gradient change. In the second row, there is a first a nicely structured curve, generally suitable for modeling, but with unequal density of data points across observed period of gen uh, of, uh, 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 across observed period and several gaps. In the final example, uh, we have a light curve with um, a convex form, which also has quite irregular and gapped structure. In all of our testing, Testings, we have encountered different challenges in attempt to achieve the best possible results with our tool. Some of the issues uh, require dividing data into subsets uh, to overcome big gaps or um, eliminating flares or including additional iterations. All of this increased processing time significantly. Um, we have also tested our code with a different setup and neural network configuration, changing uh, the number of iterations, uh, number of layers, target points, and so on. The result indicated that it would be advisable to make our code more efficient, especially keeping in mind that LSST will comprise vast amount of data. So we have attempted to optimize our code by uh, implementing uh, parallelization Python modules and testing them on our supercomputer. We have detected speed up of up to 63% while testing on four cores for 300 iterations. It is also curious that execution time decreases up to four cores for th uh, 3,000 iterations, but then it goes up again. This could be a representation of Amdahl's law, but more conclusive analysis for this uh, increase in the execution time requires further de development and additional testing. Uh, now I would like to ask Isidora to tell us about DLE2 subtask and show us the latest results. Thank you, Eva. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Isidora Jankov, and I am a PhD student at the uh, University of Belgrade in Serbia. And for the remaining time of our talk, I will describe the second subtask uh, of our LSST enabling science project, which is related to estimation of the broadline region radius of AGN using a method called photometric reverberation mapping. Uh, the key to reverberation mapping is to find the time lag between continuum and line emission, uh, which is a consequence of the broadline region light travel times. Uh, contrary to spectroscopic reverberation mapping methods, uh, this method is applicable to future LSST data. Now, uh, let's look at the composite quasar spectrum, uh, which is plotted against the LSST broadband filter response curves. Uh, for example, uh, at low redshifts, the continuum emission is covered by the I band, as shown in the light green, and H alpha uh, and H beta emission lines together with the continuum are covered by the R and G bands, respectively. As you can see, uh, in contrast to spectroscopic light curves, photometric light curves track both continuum and emission line variability together. So, uh, in order to uh, obtain a time lag between the line emission and the continuum emission using only broadband photometric filters, we use a formalism described by Chalush and Daniel and Adri and colleagues. Uh, in their formalism, the time lag is obtained by looking for a peak uh, in the difference between the cross-correlation and autocorrelation functions of light curves uh, in specific filters, covering the continuum plus line emission as denoted by the Y 
uh, uh, Y-band in this formula and continuum emission uh, exclusively as denoted by X-band in this formula. Uh, of course, uh, at larger redshifts, H alpha and H beta lines are no longer um, uh, covered in this spectral range, so we may have to use different emission lines for uh, photometric reverberation mapping and choose filters accordingly. Uh, next slide, please. Um, object uh, that we will analyze in this demonstration is NGC 4395. Uh, it is a low luminous cipher to one galaxy uh, with expected time lag of uh, the order of a few hours as confirmed by the spectroscopic reverberation mapping methods uh, using Hubble Space Telescope data. Uh, for this uh, demonstration, we use observed photometric light curves from uh, EDRI uh, et al. And uh, now uh, I will briefly uh, present the Jupyter notebook, which is aimed to reproduce the results from Edri. Uh, uh, you have three minutes left. Okay, uh, okay. All the introductory information is in this notebook, so we will skip ahead. And uh, after some brief light curve pre-processing, we will see how our data looks like. Here, uh, we have a complex light curve of our fast varying object, uh, which is varying with intraday variability. Here we analyze different light curve segments shown in the shaded areas. Uh, they're chosen because of their different characteristics. Segment one is sampled more densely and contains about 35 points. And the second segment spans a larger time interval. It is gappy and contains about 86 points. Uh, the first segment uh, is zoomed in the right panel for uh, better inspection. And now next picture. And uh, also we applied, just explained DLE1, the conditional neural process to the observa this observational data in order to obtain learned light curves in different filters. Um, and as you can see in these first two columns. And in the third column, uh, we wanted to address uh, uh, small scale oscillations uh, that are present on uh, densely sampled light curves, which were not able to be well approximated when applied to the whole light curve. And next section. And now we uh, need to calculate cross correlation functions. And in this pilot version, we uh, implement uh, only the ZDCF method developed by Alexander. Uh, but in the future, we also plan to test, di test different methods. And now uh, let's see the results. Uh, these uh, are the first results of our analysis of two light curve segments uh, that, that I described uh, and applied only on observational data. Uh, the results are shown uh, for two combinations of filters, I and R, and I and G. Uh, we can see that the results are better in the case of this densely sampled segment one than for the gappy segment two. And in the case of segment one, we could uh, we will be able to estimate the time lags uh, and they're comparable with the spectroscopic RM methods. Uh, and uh, okay. And the same analysis was also applied uh, on the first eight hours of the learned curve in the segment one, where we obtained the cross correlation functions with similar results. And uh, to conclude, uh, for the future, we plan to extend our work. Uh, since our tools are non-parametric, uh, they are also applicable to other astronomical objects. So we plan to utilize different light curve data sets, uh, for example, uh, light curves from the plastic data challenge and from the data previous. Also, we plan to test our other CCF calculation methods and uh, to use these developed methods to test our previously simulated light curves, as described by uh, Angelka Kovacevic, um, earlier for different LSST option strategies. Uh, and uh, we will work on these tasks for the next 10 months, as described in our LSST enabling science proposal. And every input and feedback is more than welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, questions and comments? Uh, uh, Mike, uh, please, Matthew, sorry. Thanks, um, a nice pair of talks. I think uh, my questions for Eva, um, I got a couple of questions, but I'll, I'll ask the rest of them on, on um, Slack. But my, I think the thing I want, want to know is um, how does this perform better than just applying a Gaussian? How does the, um, the CNP uh, work better than just applying a Gaussian process um, to the light curve? because it seems to be filling in the, the difference be, between where you have gaps and 
what's the uh, what's the performance improvement over just a, a plain Gaussian process? Uh, well, generally, we uh, didn't uh, make a, a, a comparison of, of the, these two methods. We didn't uh, make any analysis of that sort, but uh, uh, it should be uh, more um, efficient in uh, processing time. Well, you're saying, but you're saying it's taking sort of 20 to 40 minutes to get a fit for a single light curve, if I read your slides uh, right. Uh, uh, Yes, for three hundred thousand iterations. Yes, it does. But that's still that's a single light curve. Whereas a Gaussian process, I can get a fit to in a, a fraction of a second. Uh, uh, we we can uh, make um, those were the the top results, sort of say. Uh, there is uh, it it can perform uh, much faster if we take a, a smaller amount of a smaller number of iterations. And right, but the fit is going to be less good then. Yes, yes. Yeah. Now, I, I would would be an interesting. It would be interesting to see a comparison of the two. Yes, yes, um, yes. It's a it's yeah. a great point. Yes, thank you. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, more questions? Okay. If we have no more questions or comments, we can move to the next lecture. Uh, uh, Jivon Pork from Stanford University. Uh, so could you share presentation? Yes. Hi. Uh, hi. Can you... So uh, we'll talk about simulations, uh, the construction of historical inference of physical quantities from LSD like AG and light curves with basic neural networks. So please Hi, uh, thanks, Luca. Uh, can you hear me and see that my slide just advanced? Yes, yes, we can okay. hear you and can see your slide, so go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, I'm Jiwon, and I'm a grad student at Stanford, currently visiting Flatter and CCA. I mainly work with inferring H0 from lensed, strongly lensed AGNs as part of DESK. Um, but I recently joined the AGN SC and began working with unlensed AGN. Um, and today I wanted to introduce a method that I've been developing with my collaborators, including Ashley, who's on the call, um, that aims to simultaneously uh, reconstruct unobserved portions of the AGN light curve and also infer the physical quantities um, in a hierarchical Bayesian model. The tool I'm using is a probabilistic variant of neural networks called Bayesian neural networks. Um, and I'll be presenting validation results on simulated LSST-like HN-like curves. Um, and I'll cut video now for bandwidth. Um, my main motivation is that I wanna analyze all the, uh, all the LSST HNs we will observe. And from the LSST main survey alone, we're expecting around 100 million HN light curves with 50 to 200 visits per band. And each light curve will have sparse uh, irregular sampling with potentially very low signal. But if we apply stringent cuts based on data quality, we risk biasing ourselves. So we want to take advantage of all that LSST will give us. And to extract information from the many, many AGNs, each of which contributes variable amounts of information, the best approach to take is to characterize individual uncertainties accurately and combine them into a hierarchical Bayesian model. And my mental picture of the data problem here looks like this probabilistic graphical model. And if you haven't seen this before, um, Arrows indicate dependence relations, and shaded means that the quantity is observed, and unshaded means it's not observed and needs to be inferred. And we'll start from the innermost box and go out. So for each individual AGN, there's the observed portions of the light curve shaded and unobserved portions unshaded. 
And here I'm saying that there are some variability parameters that govern the temporal patterns of the light curve. They might be tau and SF infinity if we're using the damped random walk parameterization or the auto-encoded latent space if we're using ML. And in turn, these variability parameters are governed by the physical properties of the AGN since there must be some physical process driving the variability. And examples of physical parameters are black hole mass, secretion rates, redshifts. That's what happens for a single AGN. But if we zoom out and consider the whole population of AGNs, the individual physical parameters are just realizations from the distribution defined by the population level physical hyperparameters, for instance, the mean and the spread and the black hole mass of the AGN population. Hierarchical modeling um, offers two key benefits. Most importantly, it helps minimize bias by because we're explicitly inferring the population level hyperparameters and then accounting for selection effects. And it maximizes information gain because it lets us combine varying levels of signal from all the light curves available to us beyond just the well-measured golden sample. So what do we need from a hierarchical inference pipeline? First is joint light curve reconstruction and parameter inference. So here we can think of modeling the yellow dependence relation as light curve reconstruction and the green relations as parameter inference. Here variability parameters are nuisance parameters that can inform the physical properties of the AGN. So the physical properties and the fluxes should be inferred together. Second is fast and flexible fitting with minimal kernel assumptions to move away from the DRW convention or similar variants. Like Matthew suggested, ML provides the fast and over-parametrized fitting we need and here are some studies, the first two we've seen in talks by Matthew and Paula that have used ML to process AGN light curves. Third is, third is that we want our ML model to accommodate the six LSST bands together. This is especially important for AGNs without spexies so that we can do joint photo Z estimation. And of course, we want proper uncertainty quantification throughout in both light curve reconstruction and inferred physical parameters. So the uncertainties can be marginalized out in the hierarchical model. This is a lot to ask of our machinery. So we need to validate it using simulated data and then check that we get out what we put in. The simulated data we use is from the second data challenge or DC2, which is a desk-wide initiative to simulate a portion of the AGNs uh, of the LSST survey. And only the DDF region has AGNs. So we took the truth information of the 11,000 AGNs um, in the DDF. And injecting AGNs in the DDF was the work I led with France and Jim. I won't go into the details of how all these quantities were simulated, except to say that um, at the end of the day, I had 21 quantities that the network had to infer. There were nine physical parameters, um, black hole mass, I-band absolute magnitude, redshift, and the static magnitudes that included the galaxy, post-galaxy light, and I also inferred the 12 damp random walk parameters uh, to be able to interpret what the model was understanding. And this was only possible since the light curves were DRW light curves, and we wouldn't infer these if we were working with uh, real light curves. I simulated the 10-year LSST light curves using the DRW model with the early, betans, early baseline cadence, Minion 1016. And I render Gaussian errors of 0.01 millimags, sorry, 0.01 mags. And for simplicity, I assumed I band cadence for all filters. 
The base ML architecture I use for a joint light curve reconstruction and parameter inference is called an attentive neural process. I modified it to return the full posterior PDF over the light curve and the target parameter, so I call it a Bayesian attentive neural process. But at its core, it's a latent variable model like autoencoders, which Matthew and Paula already explained. And the attentive neural process is pretty much identical to the conditional neural process that Eva presented, except that there is a stochastic latent space and also an attention mechanism that allows the model to weight some time samples more than others. We input the six filter time series and have the model encoded into a stochastic latent space. This is a reduced dimension representation of the time series. Then the model takes this latent space and then decodes it to predict the UGR UGRIZY flux at some query times. And also the latent space is used to predict the physical properties and the variability property, 21 of them at the same time. Um, here is how the model performed in reconstructing the kind of light curves it was trained on, um, which were sampled at I-band cadence in all bands. So here, uh, blue points are the context points that I give to the network at test time, and the black points are the target points I ask it to infer, and red is the network posterior. And you should ignore the error bands wherever there aren't any points. The split between context and target is a little hard to tell because the I-band cadence already has very few points, but overall, the Posterior is consistent with the truth, and this is what we observe across all the validation set light curves. To get a better sense of the reconstruction quality, I increased the number of context and target points at test time. And again, the network posterior in red um, is consistent with the truth everywhere. And I was especially surprised by a uh, behavior like this one because the network somehow seems to know that there should be a bump here, although it has nothing to go off of. Um, there are no blue points here. And the regular Gaussian process fit with the damped random walk kernel would have put a straight line through the nearest input point. So straight line through this blue point and this blue point here. Um, and here is a posterior PDF for a single validation AGN. The red contour is the network posterior over a subset of our 21 target quantities, um, which are the two damped random walk parameters, the black hole mass, the absolute I-band magnitude, and redshift. And the gray is the training set distribution. And I've overlaid the truth in black lines. For this AGN, the truth falls within the one sigma critical interval. I've visualized this for a single validation AGN, but we have to check, um, are the posterior statistically consistent with the truth across the validation set? And this calibration curve is, uh, does exactly that. Uh, it's a multi-dimensional generalization of the commonly used frequency versus confidence calibration. And in the interest of time, I'll skip the details of this metric, except to say that uh, gray dotted indicates perfect calibration. And we see that our model calibration curve falls on top of the gray. Um, for yeah, additional description of this calibration metric, you can look at the appendix of Park et al. 2021. The BANP, our model posteriors are accurate, precise, and statistically consistent, but with the caveat that they're conditioned on the training set distribution. And the training set acts as kind of an interim prior. And the test distributions you might see in the sky are probably different from the training set we chose. To correct for mismatches between the training and test distributions, um, 
I apply the importance weighting based hierarchical inference method um, that our group developed in Wagner Karina et al. 2020 to infer the population based type parameters. And I do a demonstration on just redshift, although we'd want to do this for other quantities. So this test, this demonstration involved first training on a broad redshift prior. Um, so this means a broad uh, distribution in the redshift projection, uh, which is in gray here. And then testing on 50 particularly high redshift AGNs um, designed to follow a normal of mean 2.5 and standard deviation 0.2. Then omitting the fine details, I use MCMC to infer these two hyperparameters, 2.5 and 0.2. Then I use this knowledge of the test distribution to reweight the individual redshift posteriors. And this entails dividing out by the training set in term prior and then applying the test set distribution instead. I'm describing the steps uh, only in broad strokes here, but the main takeaway is that I'm hierarchically inferring the mean and standard deviation of the population redshift distribution. On 50 uh, test AGNs, we can recover the true hyperparameters of the mean and the standard deviation, so um, the 2.5 and 0.2 being the truth. And the mean recovery is pretty good. And this contour will shrink as we include more lenses in the test set. In general, it struggles more with uh, the sigma, but it's also possible the CMC chains didn't converge fully. And on the right are the individual redshift posteriors before and after hierarchical reweighting. Um, before is in red and after is in blue and each dot here is a test agent. There are uh, two sets of 50 of them. Um, before the posteriors kind of lie on the low side because they're biased by the training set prior, but applying our new knowledge about the test distribution um, helps de-bias them a little. So um, in summary, I'm operating under the hierarchical inference framework to tackle the large volume of each noisy AGN time series that we expect from LSST. And since I, am I out of time? Yes, yes, you have time. Um, okay, I'll end on the next step slide and then take questions. Okay, thank you. So questions? Uh, Paula. Hi, thanks. So thanks for this very interesting talk. I think if we can prove that this can be applied to real data, this will be super useful for real moving. So one problem I have with using simulated data is that maybe the model is just learning the process behind the, the Likert simulations. How can you ensure that that's not happening when you use simulated Likerts? Um, yeah, so this, uh, the reason I use simulated data was so that I could test, like validate the entire pipeline um, on known truth. So we know that at least it can, it has an understanding of uh, a two point correlation. So the damped random walk kernel. Um, and of course, real data uh, might not follow the stochastic process, but uh, there are ways that we can make the model um, uh, more, uh, fit better to uh, uh, various ranges of stochastic dynamics. And one of them is this latent stochastic differential equation model that Matthew presented, which explicitly encodes the diffusion and drift terms in the dynamics. Um, so there are things we can do at, at present. We don't know if the model is just fitting to the damped random walk, but um, we know, um, at least from your work and Matthew's work, that neural networks have the flexibility to fit to a wide range of dynamics. Okay. Thanks. 
Okay, more questions? Uh, you? Thanks, yeah. Yeah, just a, yeah, thank you. Uh, just a quick question, uh, very good work. Uh, have you tried on like modeling, like maybe changing look quasars? Uh, maybe that would be another way to validate if the model is flexible enough um, or is it just fitting the DRW uh, kernel? Just curious. Yeah, uh, thanks. I haven't tried that, um, but I agree it's an interesting test. Um, the latent space that the model has will likely uh, contain information about anomalies, um, so it, it can probably be used for anomaly detection, um, similar to the way Paula uh, uh, detected uh, change changing the quasars in her data set. Okay, thank you. Thank you. More questions? Um, if not, uh, we, uh, we can move to next uh, lecture. Uh, Jian Wei Liu will present from uh, the University of Arizona. will present the talk, uh, Resolving the Quasar Torus with Public Optical and Mid-Infrared Time Domain Surveys. Uh, current status and future outlook. So please. Thank you. So hello everyone, I'm Jian Wei Lü. Uh, I obtained my PhD last year and I'm now a postdoc in the James Y. Mirai Science Team at University of Arizona. So my research mainly focuses on the dusty side of supermassive black holes and their host galaxy across the observed universe. So actually I just joined the LS ST Agent Science Collaboration about two weeks ago, and this is my first time to show up. So I will just want to say hi again. So today I will talk about how to resolve the quasar torus with public optical and medium bright time domains. So the first is some little background. So we know that some dusty torus like structure is a key component of the aging unification. It is commonly believed that Weyl's type of aging are mainly caused by the different observing angles relative to the central engine that is uh, surrounded by this optically sync and isotropic obscuring component. And in addition, the torus has the physical scales that bridge the black hole equation and the whole galaxy interstellar median, which provides important insights on the growth of supermassive black holes. According to some simulation work as shown in the middle panel, once you turn on the quasar or the agent feedback, you will end up with this concave shape and the torus-like structure. So it seems that the obscuration component is a natural product of black hole accretion with agent feedback. And thirdly, the merger-driven merger galaxy evolution theory predicts that the obscuration status of the nuclear is dependent on different evolution evolutionary status and the aging dust environment expected change accordingly, accordingly along this track. Thus, observationally want to know if the total structure changed from one agent to another. Unfortunately, all these are just some nice pictures and the nuclear obscuration or the torus is too compact to be studied directly. So depending on the observed wavelengths, the torus typical size is in the order of 0.1 to 10 parsec, even for the nearest type 1 AG, NG, AGM in NGC 4151. Uh, we need a resolution down to 0.001 to 0.1 arc second to resolve it. And uh, fortunately, we can use the uh, infrared uh, light curve to map out the toro structure. So as we all know that aging is time variable. So if you have a flare in the optical which traces the uh, equation disk emission, you will end up with a light curve with a flare like this. And the torus infrared emission uh, come from some larger distance. So you will see some time lag between the optical and infrared, infrared light curve. So by marrying the time lag, you can prove the physical size of the dust emission region. So this is what we know as dust vibration mapping technique. Historically, uh, aging dust vibration mapping is technical challenge. So on the left, I show 
a figure of the optical and the near infrared light curve of the famous agent file of Nye uh, from Clive uh, 1989. So you can say the time span is about 4,000 days over 10 years. So, uh, so after about uh, 30 years since Clive et al. 2018, uh, only about 30 agents 30, 31 agents have reported K-band vibration mapping results, and only one agent has reported meeting fried vibration results from the Spitzer IRAC data. But then why is so difficult? Look at this figure again. So to detect a torus vibration signal, you need repeated optical and infrared observations over a few years to several decades. And uh, it is very time consuming. And uh, also, you need uh, to coordinate the multi-wavelength observations. Uh, sometimes it's not so easy because of like telescope access issues, weather conditions, or some uh, instrument failures. And lastly, uh, I want to point out in some cases, the agent may not show detectable variability when you are monitoring it. So some good luck is needed to make the program successful. Okay, fortunately, we now have the WISE or new WISE mission to access the medium infrared time domain window of the whole sky. And uh, this is actually a small infrared uh, space telescope with about 40 centimeter aperture. And it conducts the medium infrared imaging sur survey of the whole sky with a candidate about half a year. So at the beginning, this is a general purpose infrared survey called wide field infrared survey explorer. And uh, later it has changed to near earth object wise or near wise or later it's also called near wise reactive. So uh, right now this is a mission mainly hunting for near earth object. And uh, uh, I want to point out that the very first two bands, the wide W1 and W2 are still working today and the whole sky has been monitored uh, by this mission about 17 times with a time coverage over 10 years. So in 2009, we have published a work to show how to combine the wise or new wise time domain medium fried data together with some ground transient optical transient service like CRTS uh, PTS and uh, Assassin uh, to conduct quasi uh, dust vibration mapping service. So here I just show the time and the wavelength coverage of these different missions, uh, different missions. And the red line here is uh, SD of a uh, normal agent. And uh, you can say that you, you should look at figure uh, by rotating your hand about 90 degree. So you will say that the UV opt part is a bump which traces the equation disk emission. And uh, the infrared bump uh, starts at like 1.3 micron. It is uh, from mainly from the torus. So with all this data, you can trace the uh, variability in the uh, equation from the equation disk in the optical and uh, use the median infrared data from Spitzer wise or new wise to trace the variability uh, from the torus. So here I just show some example optical wave band light curves and the median fright W1 and W2 band uh, light curves are some PG quasars. Also ignoring all the details, we have like two major steps to measure the time lag. So the first step is we merge and interpolate the optical light curves from different sources with a damped to random worker model. And step two, we will fit this infrared light curves by shifting and smoothing the optical model following this equation. So this is the uh, infrared light curve and uh, uh, this is the optical light curve with a time like delta T and we smoothed it with a window size about tau W and there is a scaling factor to describe the relative variability of two, these two bands. And finally there's a constant non-variable component. Okay, so uh, from the left to the right, the measure time lag in the medium fret is about 50 days, 300 days, and uh, uh, 500 days. And uh, in this figure, 
we just show the relation between our married uh, mean fried time lag in the YSW1 band and W2 band as a function of aging bolometric luminosity, which we got from SD fitting. So you can say uh, the time lag is strongly correlated with the aging bolometric luminosity. And uh, I, want, I forgot to mention that this study is mainly on the 87 PG quasars at low redshift. Actually, uh, besides some objects that do not show were beta signal or have very poor data, we almost got all objects with convincing meeting fry time lag measurements uh, in the YSW1 and W2 band simultaneously. So we fit uh, this uh, time lag and aging luminosity in log space. And we got uh, equation like this one and this one. So we found that the meeting fry time lag is proportional to the square root of the agent luminosity, which expected uh, from the theory. And uh, we also reanalyze the uh, K-band uh, revision mappings a sample uh, from Koshida et al. Uh, 2009, and we derive a uh, wavelength dependent torus size ratio uh, as a function of uh, this wavelength. So actually this is also the first time we got the total uh, size ratio as a function of time uh, in the literature. And uh, uh, besides this paper, I also want to list several other notable works using the new wise new wise data and other uh, optical even or X-ray synergies to demonstrate the size opportunities from such, such multi-wavelength time domain study. So this includes some relative classical dust vibration mapping, including some high redshift quasars, as well as some obscure systems, as well as some other time domain study like uh, of tidal disruption event, the TDE, or some changing look agent and some other interesting target. Okay, you, you are very welcome to check out our paper and this paper at the same time. And I want to point out the current such studies uh, I think it's largely limited by the optical data. So this is a figure from our 2019 paper. So you can say we have to merge the optical time domain data from different sources. And they actually coming from different, different systems with different filters. So actually the CRST do not contain a filter and the assassin is mainly uh, in the V band and the PTF is in the G and R band. And uh, yeah, so you also need to deal with the calibration issues, as well as you can see some very noisy data in the assessment data. So sometimes you have to merge the data point at different epoch to get a reasonable uh, light curve. And uh, also due to the sensitivity limit of this service, uh, current study are only limited to very bright agents. And also lastly, I want to point sometimes uh, the data that curve will have some irregular sampling, which made uh, the fitting won't work easily. Okay, so uh, finally, I think LST will drastically change the situation. Uh, before we talk uh, more about this, let's say what uh, are the possible infrared time domain service after new wise. So basically, a uh, new wise has fundings uh, to 2023. Uh, as far as I know. And uh, later on, we will have a mission called Phoenix, uh, which will uh, be launched uh, uh, in an ideal case in 2024. And uh, later there would be a new new server, near Earth server, which is scheduled to be launched uh, in 2026. So both of them are passive cooled uh, small infrared uh, telescopes and the Phoenix have a spectral meter with relatively low resolution, carrying a wavelength from 0.8 to 5 micron. And uh, it will survey the whole sky similarly to new wise. And uh, the candidate of the light curve is also about every six months. And uh, the new wise surveyor only contains two broad band uh, uh, imaging uh, detectors but the wavelength is much longer, one at uh, 4 to 5.2 5 micron and another uh, from 6 to 10 micron. And it will uh, survey a specific uh, area of the sky. So this is just looking around the Earth's orbit to see whether we can detect some near Earth objects. 
and the candidate is much higher, it's about uh, 11 days. And uh, it is scheduled this mission can last at least five years or even 10 years uh, if they got enough funding, okay. Then here I just show some uh, op, uh, infra, op, uh, no, the FDs of agent for different type of objects. So basically besides this normal agent, which have a strong peak from the near to the mid infra, there are also something called warm dust deficient agent or hot dust deficient agent. You can read this paper to know the details. And on the left panel here, I just show the wavelength coverage of this mission. So you can see the Phoenix covers the uh, optical red to the near infrared uh, up to like three micron, the hot dust emission bump. And the new survey uh, uh, covers the wavelengths at, uh, at uh, covers longer wavelengths, mainly warming at, uh, only targeting the warm dust from the turtles uh, in the low redshift. And uh, in this figure, I just uh, plot the detected limit for an unobstructed normal agent from these uh, different missions. And uh, for this infrared uh, curves here, which is orange, red, and uh, blue light, uh, I use dotted light to indicate that this band or this wavelength coverage will no longer sample the torus emission. So uh, basically you can only use a solid light, this limited, you can conduct wavelengths uh, conduct dust vibration mapping below uh, this redshift. And you can see the LST is pretty sensitive and our uh, vibration mapping program will be limited by the infrared uh, sensitivity of this mission. So with Phoenix and new wise survey band one. So I think most quasars with photometric luminosity 10, greater than 10 to the 11, solar luminosity can be mapped in the raspberry mid infrared at a uh, redshift less than 0.5. And we can also map uh, those bright agents or quasars uh, in the near infrared at redshift round two. And with the new survey band two, we may even carry out that vibration mapping of the few most bright quasars at redshift greater than five, okay. So uh, now I show the time, again, I just show the uh, time and wavelength coverage of all the missions that are available to carry out uh, this uh, dust vibration mapping study. So combine, combine the LST's Phoenix and new survey with other missions I have shown previously. We can actually have tens of thousands agents uh, with optical and infrared multiband light curve spanning a time scale of over 20 years. So this is pretty exciting. But what we can really learn from this. Long you you time. have three minutes left. Okay, yes, yeah, thank you. So, what we can really learn from this very long term optical infrared synergy. So, to answer this question, I'd like to briefly introduce a case study of NGC 4151 published by us this year. So, as the most famous, one of the most famous type one agent, people have monitored this object intensely, intensively at different wavelengths and ended up with optical and uh, infrared time domain data that covers over three decades. So here I just show the optical B band and the near infrared and mid infrared GHKL light curve of this agent. Uh, we actually studied all this data together with some new source and methods and obtained many interesting science results. So the first uh, science example that we can use this uh, long-term multi-wavelength time, time domain data is we can combine the multi-wavelength dust vibration mapping with uh, agent as analyzed to get a uh, complete pictures of the total structure. So we actually have demonstrated that from a detailed analyze of the GHKL uh, time domain data of NGC 4151, uh, we actually can uh, estimate that there are two dust vibration components uh, in the near infrared vibration signal. So one corresponds to the carbon sublimation with a dust temperature around 2000 Kelvin at a distance about 0 0.03 parsec. And another component is a silicate dust sublimation which have a low temperature around 1000 K at a larger distance about 0 0.08 parsec. And this kind of conclusion are actually consistent with the theoretical expectation because we know there are silicate dust and graphite dust in the agent torus. 
as well as some detailed radiation transfer calculations. You can read more about this paper to uh, check the details. Also, we also can uh, get some vibration signal even at 10 micron. This just shows the uh, N-band light curve, which is uh, right down here, uh, and some uh, longer wavelength data as well. So at 10 micron, we detect a time like about 3,000 days, which correspond uh, to some warm dust emission, which has a dis at a distance about 2.5 parsec. And at 20 to 40 micron, we do not detect any evidence of obesity. So they must come from some cold bust in some more extended region. And we can actually combine all these vibration mapping uh, results with uh, HNSD analysis. So again, this is relatively complicated topic. So you uh, may need to read our 2008 paper to learn how we analyze the SD of uh, aging, particular like NGC 4151. So we found the village that you can decompose uh, in the first order of the torus uh, emission into four components. And we actually have the constraints of the physical this size or the distribution of each dust component, as well as the temperatures. So finally, we build up a consistent picture of the torus. And we can actually constrain both the radio and the vertical structure at the same time and compare the, like, the uh, torus opening angle with uh, uh, narrow line region opening angle from HSD observation as some interferometry and uh, imaging observations in the medium of right. Okay, you can. I welcome you to check the paper to learn more. And the second exciting example is that we can test the receding torus picture. So we know that the dust size is proportional to the aging luminosity. So for NGC 4151, its emission has been worried about well, seven times uh, over uh, several decades. So uh, you are expected to see some uh, torus size change like this blue, like blue curve here in the middle panel. But however, from our measurement, we actually didn't detect any convincing change of the infrared time lag uh, over 10 years time scale. So we gave a physical explanation is that basically the torus can be turbulent and optically thin dust clouds need a time scale of a decade or longer to be destroyed. So this is not a surprising result. And the third science example is that besides the size information, we can also conduct some long-term evolution of torus properties. So basically, I want to give you a very quick conclusion is that we found the near infrared flux of NGC 4151 is increasing gradually, partaking the dust vibration signal. And the growth rate of the hot dust emission is about 4% of uh, per year. And if you translate this growth rate to a mass growth uh, speed, it will be about this quantity. And we expand this observation uh, as since, since NGC 41 is known to have strong outflows with outflow rate around this number, and you just assume a gas, gas to dust mass ratio below 300 to uh, 8,000, which is very reasonable, you can provide required dust mass. Okay, so with uh, IOST and the Phoenix and the new ones, we can conduct similar studies. Uh, like NGC 4151, possibly for thousand or even uh, thousand of 10,000 objects like this. So here is a concluding slide. I have like two or uh, three uh, take home message. So the first one is statistical data reference mapping of the quasar torus has already been made possible with the wise new wise uh, medium fry time dump data and the ground based optical transient service. And from a case study of multi-band infrared dust vibration signal of NGC 4151, we have obtained many new insights into the aging torus and demonstrated the ample discovery space offered by combining the long-term optical and infrared time domain data. And lastly, the synergy between LST and future IR time domain service, such as Phoenix and new survey would revolutionize the agent vibration mapping study and yield many exciting results. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So we have also time for questions. So you. 
Uh, thanks, Jianwei. So I have a comment and uh, yeah. a quick question. So the comment is uh, uh, Yang et al. 2020 also did a similar, uh, yeah. sorry, I came in uh, late, so I did probably mention yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the question is that, um, what about uh, the prospects of um, combining LSST and uh, Roman? So you can only oh, do very yeah. low redshift, uh, but you can go much yeah. deeper. Yeah. So yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I forgot to mention, actually there are time domain uh, program in the uh, Tesco you mentioned as well as uh, James Webb. But I think it's just limited to a relative small field. So I didn't mention that in detail. Yeah, definitely it's possible. You can reach deeper, uh, deeper sensitivity and definitely you can detect some faint agent or some very high ratio object. But I didn't show this time. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Do we have more questions? If not, uh, then we have also, uh, sorry, Paula, please. Yeah, hi, thanks. Thanks for the interesting talk. So one question about uh, the method you're using to compute uh, the lags. How sensitive is to the to the proper modeling of the Lakers, to the damp random work modeling? Because I guess uh, you're modeling oh. the Lakers independently or um, you're doing okay. more to that? So I think, I'm not sure whether you are asking the, like, uh, the date candidates issue or the, whether we can get good constraint of the damp, damp random worker model. But what I mean is that if you're introducing some uh, I don't know, noise to the to the analysis uh, uh -huh. just because you're not properly uh, modeling the the white. I, I'm talking about the white slackers in particular, which oh, are only yeah. a few points. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Sorry, I should mention that. Um, where you only have a few points, and mm -hmm. but you have this model. Uh, so for to get that model, are you using multiband modeling or? Single bug because uh, you see some a lot of structure in the dampen and work model. Uh -huh, how yeah. how can that affect the real measurement of the time lag, the actual value? Have you tested that? Okay, okay, yeah, we have considered the uh, possible errors like caused either by the uh, like the flux uncertainty as well as some small variability features from the uh, optical light curve. So the basic conclusion is we only need some uh, optical, smallest optical light curve over a candidate about 10 days. So basically all the small features will be smoothed out for most objects. And uh, yeah, we, we did some tests. So it's not a super uh, a big issue for most objects, but definitely, yes, there are some objects that have very noisy data or have very strong variability that even uncorrelated with uh, infrared data. And in that case, I only uh, so in the whole PG sample, I think only there are only one or two objects like that. So uh, in this plot, I forgot to mention, this is an error bar. So it's generally large, but still uh, you can get some statistic constraint since you have more objects. So yeah, we, we have considered that. So you may check out our paper. So uh, in this paper, it's actually, we did that relatively simple. We just did a chi-square minimization. But right now we have a MCMC fitting code, which is more robust. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Uh, then we, we have a short break. Uh, uh, see you again at 1.25 p.m. In the uh, the crack window, right? Yeah, we, we can see. We can see. So uh, go it's not not it's not the presenter's view, right? Just make sure. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, that's great. So, hello everyone. This is Ming Hao from the University of Arizona, and uh, I just joined this uh, collaboration like a few weeks ago, and uh, I'm happy to see you in this meeting. 
Uh, I'm a fifth year grad student working with Professor Xiao Hui Fan. And first, let me thank the organizers to give me this opportunity. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to introduce our recent studies about the high redshift lens quasar population and how LSST will help us to find these objects. I mean, by the way, uh, when I say high redshift in this talk, I mean redshift higher than five, it just to clarify. Uh, OK, why is it important to have a complete survey of high redshift lens quasars? I mean, lens quasars are valuable objects regardless of its redshift, but lensing is particularly important and useful at high redshift. The first point is that lensing magnification distorts the observed luminosity functions. Uh, the example I'm showing here is for high redshift galaxies from which we can see that the, the effect of lensing is pretty significant, uh, especially in the bright end. The second reason is that lensing enhances the source plane sensitivity and resolution. This is especially useful at high redshift where everything's faint. Uh, for example, our group discovered a lens quasar at redshift 6.5 a couple of years ago. And this quasar has a large magnification of about 51, which provides a great opportunity to study a high redshift quasar with excellent data quality. However, one problem is that high redshift lens quasars are so rare. I mean, this quasar I'm showing here is the only lens quasar known at redshift higher than five so far. Given their importance, we definitely want to find more of them, but it turns out to be extremely challenging. Actually, it has been predicted for a long time that the lens fraction of high redshift quasars should be large due to strong magnification bias. However, in the real world, the observed lens fraction is much, much lower than the model predictions. This discrepancy is a well-known issue in high redshift quasar surveys, namely most high redshift lens quasars are missed by current surveys. So to discover this missing population, we need to figure out what causes this problem. I mean, generally speaking, there are two possibilities. The first one is that uh, the models or the, pre the, the theoretical predictions have some deficits uh, the other one is that the surveys of high redshift quasars might be just incomplete, especially for lens ones. Probably the best way to investigate this problem is to simulate the lens quasars as realistic as possible and to perform mock observations on them so that we can see what, what, what do these objects look like and what's exactly going on in the quasar surveys. In other words, what we want to do is to build a mock catalog with simulated observations of lens quasars. So in order to build a good mock catalog, the key thing is that we need to have accurate descriptions of the background quasars and the foreground galaxies. Or to be more specific, we need accurate quasar luminosity functions and galaxy velocity dispersion functions. I mean, here I'm using the velocity dispersions as the measurement of the deflector mass. And I will show the reason in the next few slides. The good thing is we think we know quite well about the quasar luminosity functions, at least to let's say redshift about six. So we compile a number of recent measurements of the quasar luminosity functions. And most of them reach a depth of minus 22 absolute magnitude. We simulate the quasars using the code SYNQSO, which takes the quasar luminosity function as an the input, then generate a sample of mock quasars and build a simulated spectrum for each of them. For the deflector galaxies, we use the Cosmo DC2 catalog, which is a mock galaxy catalog built for the LSS for the LSST survey. I mean, Cosmo DC2 provides many galaxy properties, including the masses, the shapes, and the SEDs, uh, which makes it ideal for our purpose. We use singular isothermal ellipsoids to, 
to describe the lensing potential where the velocity dispersion scales the Einstein radius. And that's why we really care about the velocity dispersion. Correctly reproducing the observed velocity dispersion is critical to accurately calculating the number of lens quasars. And Cosmo DC2 does a good job in this. You can see that it accurately reproduces the observed velocity dispersion function out to at least redshift 1.5. We further calculate the SEDs and generate simulated LSST images for the mock lens quasars. Here are some examples of the mock images from which we can see that the mock catalog includes lenses with a variety of magnitudes, colors, and lensing configurations. Okay, I think I should summarize the workflow and the data products of the mock catalog a little bit here. The mock catalog includes quasars up to redshift 7.5 and down to an absolute magnitude of minus 21. It is highly complete for lensing systems with Einstein radius larger than 0.07 arc second. And this basically covers all the lens quasars we will find even with space telescopes. Uh, we use this mock catalog to predict the statistics of high redshift lens quasars and it can serve as training or testing sets for high redshift lens quasar surveys. I mean, although we focus on the high redshift, the mock catalog should be useful for lens quasar related studies at all redshifts. And we try to make our code and data products flexible and easy to use. I mean, there is a very, very primary version of the code and data products in my GitHub. And I, I'm still working on updating it and probably we'll see a better version in the near future. Now, with the mock catalog, we can eventually try to figure out how many lens quasars we can find. So here, one key concept is the definition of a discoverable lens. The point being, sometimes we can detect a lens quasar in an imaging survey but it, does, it doesn't mean that we can identify it as a lensing system. So in the famous paper, Ogley and Marshall 2010, the authors proposed the criteria of a discoverable lens quasar, which basically require us to, I mean, basically requires that we need to at least marginally resolve the lensing system, and we need to marginally detect the fainter lens image. I mean, I feel that these criteria are pretty optimistic, but we can see what we can get. Under this definition, we estimate the number of discoverable lens quasars in several imaging surveys. The mock catalog suggests that current sky surveys will only have a handful of uh, high redshift lens quasars that are discoverable, while LSST will increase this number to about 40. Again, uh, I want to emphasize that this is the ideal case. I am assuming 100% survey completeness, and I'm not excluding the low galactic latitude area where the surveys are, I mean, practically impossible. As such, uh, what I've learned from these results is that, first, we practically cannot find many high redshift lens quasars with current sky surveys. I mean, here, now we have one at redshift 6.5. I would say it's not, it's not too bad. Uh, and second, if we want to build a good sample of high redshift lens quasars, we need LSST. So then there's the question, why did previous models predict that we can find a good number of lens quasars at redshift say around six? So one reason is that they count all the lens quasars that have magnified flux brighter than the detection limit. In other words, they count all the detectable lens quasars. However, as, as we just discussed, detecting a lens quasar in an imaging survey doesn't mean that we can identify it. And the second reason is that there are some significant uncertainties in the deflector uh, velocity dispersion function. So here, as an example, we compare the lens fraction of our mock catalog and that of White et al. 2002. I mean, this is, uh, 
roughly speaking, the fraction of length quasars among all the quasars beyond some uh, flux limit. So uh, White et al. use a different approach to estimate deflector velocity dispersion function. And they predict a length fraction that is about seven times higher than our mock kappa. Correspondingly, their velocity dispersion function is about 0.8 dex higher than the Cosmo DC2 VDF. So we can see that the velocity dispersion function really offers the major source of systematic uncertainties in the predicted number of lenses. Uh, we notice that the VDF beyond the local universe is not very well constrained. And we find from the literature that different assumptions in the velocity dispersion function will easily lead to a factor of, let's say, zero or four systematic uncertainties in the predicted uh, number of lenses. So I would suggest that when interpreting lensing statistics, I mean, not only in this work, but also for other similar studies, we should be very careful about the assumptions of the velocity dispersion function of the deflectors. Uh, to summarize, we think we can answer the question we asked uh, at the beginning of this talk. Why previous models predict much more high rush dense quasars than we have found? The reasons are first, many of the detectable lens quasars are not discoverable. And second, the assumptions in the deflector velocity dispersion functions introduce significant uncertainties. Okay, so far we have discussed more on the theoretical side, and now I will move to the survey or observational side. Our mock catalog predicts that uh, there will be tens of discoverable high redshift lens quasars in the LSST survey. And the question is, how can we find them? Thanks to the great work by many of you in this collaboration, the searches for high redshift quasars have been very successful. However, lens quasars uh, have some distinct observational features compared to normal quasars. So we cannot stick on the traditional service strategy and simply wait for the great data quality of LSST to solve everything. Uh, traditional surveys for high redshift quasars rely heavily on color cuts and morphological selections. I mean, we're basically selecting only uh, point sources as candidates. While for lens quasars, due to the flux from the foreground galaxy and the extended lensing structures, we expect that traditional survey strategies should have low completeness. As an example, we test our mock catalog against the candidate selection uh, methods in Yang et al. 2017, uh, which searches for quasars around ratio 5.5 and is estimated to have a high completeness. So uh, first we wanna do a sanity check where we only consider the flux from the background quasars in our mock lenses. And the gray histogram shows the number of quasars selected by the color cuts in this way. And we got a high completeness, which is expected and which is good. Uh, when we add the deflector flux into the lensing systems, the number of selected lens quasars goes to the blue histogram. And if we further require that the object appears to be a point source, the number goes to the orange histograms. So obviously the traditional candidate selection methods for high rush of quasars, I mean, it simply doesn't work for lensed ones. And I think I can add a third answer to the question that is current surveys are highly incomplete for high redshift lens quasars. As the commissioning of LSST is approaching, we really need to figure out a complete and efficient way of identifying high redshift lens quasar candidates. I mean, the survey strategy is a large topic and I think I only have time to briefly discuss some rough ideas. So we notice that surveys for low redshift lens quasars have been very successful which have doubled the number of known lens quasars in the last five years. So following the ideas uh, in these successful surveys, 
a good strategy might be to select extra galactic objects with a loose color cut, or to say the first step is to just get rid of all the galactic stars. And then we can identify objects with lens-like morphology in the remainders. You, you have three minutes left. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, okay, uh, the first step, I mean, to getting rid of the galactic stars is kind of straightforward. Well, the second step is difficult, is complicated, especially for noisy images or for uh, compact lensing systems that are only marginally resolved in, like say, the, the, the imaging surveys. Fortunately, there is one good thing about high redshift quasars. They drop out in short wavelengths due to the absorption of IgM, say in G-band. As such, we can accurately measure the flux profile of the foreground galaxy using the G-band image, then identify any additional features in longer wavelengths, for example, in Z-band. Uh, these additional features should come from the background quasar. This allows us to disentangle the flux from the foreground galaxy and the background quasar in a pretty straightforward way. Then we can check if the flux distribution is consistent with the lens model or not. This is extremely useful for LSS, for LSST since the G-band photometry will be deep enough to measure the defector galaxy for most of the high redshift lens quasars. Based on these ideas, we have started designing a candidate selection pipeline and tested against current imaging surveys. So roughly speaking, the methods contains three steps. The first step is a loose color cut uh, to get rid of galactic stars. And the second step is a one component image fitting, mainly for identifying objects with complex structures that cannot be well described by, let's say, a single PSF or a regular surface profile. I mean, these objects are more likely to be lenses. And then the third step is the image differencing and lens modeling as described in my previous slide. So I'll be very grateful if you have any ideas, comments, suggestions, and I'm happy to talk about it later. Uh, and I will put my summary here and I'm happy to take any question. Okay, then we start with questions. Mike. Um, so one of the things that we that we did many years ago with the early uh, STSS quasars was to image them with uh, HST. So the discoverable limit was uh, quite a bit uh, more refined than the LSST limit. Uh, and we didn't find any, any high redshift quasars, uh, lens high redshift quasars, as you know. Uh, those were all objects that were, by definition, unresolved in STSS. Uh, but, um, but at HST resolution, we imagined we'd be sensitive to close pairs. Um, and again, didn't find any. I don't know if you want to comment on that and whether that might be an approach uh, going forward. Uh, for example, perhaps adaptive optics imaging of uh, quasars that are identified, quasar, um, high redshift quasars identified with LSST or other surveys. Uh, to, to go look for, for lenses or whether we're, we've already uh, thrown away all the good candidates uh, by our selection. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so my first comment, yeah, thanks for the, the great question. So first, I want to talk a little bit about the, the definition of a detectable lens. So, I mean, th this definition is like, uh, it's requiring it to be, uh, I mean, when you look at the survey image, uh, we can kind of realize that, oh, this one might be lens. But I just, as you said, sometimes this is not necessary for us to find the lens. We can just go through high resolution images of uh, known quasars and to find if they can resolve in, man, in a very small scale. Uh, but the, the, the first thing I want to comment is, uh, according to my mock catalog, uh, you can see that the fraction of lenses that are that compact is actually not, uh, not, not very large. Let's say, uh, let, let's say if LSST can resolve pairs with uh, a separation of like 0.3, uh, sorry, 0.7 arc second, and uh, it, 
according to this mock catalog, we can see that most of the lenses are larger than that separation. So I feel that the bottleneck is really the depth of the imaging service. Let's say uh, if we cannot detect the fainter len lens image of the quasar, what we will see is a point source and a galaxy next to it. And we can find tons of such objects as a, a star superimposed uh, superposed with a galaxy. So, I mean, th this makes the survey extremely difficult, but I won't say it's impossible. So if we can do a very good uh, decomposition of such systems and do some very nice pho forced photometry, we can still probably identify quasars, let's say drop house in blue bands and uh, select them as candidates and identify them. Uh, and of course, uh, high resolution images is a key step in identifying lensing systems with sub arc second separation. I mean, if we see a blended image of a lens, we probably cannot uh, assert that this is a lensing system with LSSD like images. So I, I don't know if this answers your question. I mean, selecting yeah, those. No. This, this graph, I think, really does answer my question. It really does make the point. Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, uh, selecting lenses with different lensing configuration is it's very, uh, it, it's kind of a complicated process. So I, I don't expect a single cut can solve everything. Right. Yeah, right. thank you. Okay. Thank, okay. You. thank you. Jeff? Yeah, you talked about the possibility of using color and morphology to, to look for, for things that are really quasars. But yeah. what about ex exploiting the variability information or the difference imaging? Yeah, definitely. That, that, that's a great comment. And this is, uh, th th this is very useful. Actually, it has been, uh, it has been tested for uh, low redshift lens quasar surveys. And uh, I mean, it has been successful in finding some low redshift lenses. So this is, uh, of course, something we, 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 we want to add into our service strategy. So we are still kind of uh, developing this uh, pipeline. I mean, as, as, as I said, there's only very few discoverable lens quasars in current service. I mean, mainly because the current service are not deep enough. And uh, I, I mean, naively, I feel that detecting a, a building a good light curve requires a good photometry. And so I'm kind of expecting at least for current surveys, uh, the light curves are not good enough for, for me to find high redshift lenses. So I'm kind of putting it into the next step and we want to first try uh, something we can do with current imaging surveys, like fitting the image or some selection based on colors. But yes, uh, variability is definitely a very good addition to the selection methods. And it's probably the key for us to find some weird lensing structure like if we cannot just cannot resolve it or the the second brightest image is just too faint for us to tell but the the bright image is bright enough to give us a light curve and we can pick it up yeah thank you thank you <clears throat> i saw maurizio you raised hand so do you like to ask no me? thanks jeff jeff asked my same question um, okay, I'm, I'm... we have several uh, several questions in uh, uh, in in the chat. So yeah, I'm I'm checking the the, the if you can check it chat. or yeah yeah we have one minute more to to simply um, you can answer on some of them or simply to answer on chat. Oh, I I I saw a question about uh, like two quasars with small separation. They could be also uh binary quasars and yeah i mean binary quasars i you, you can see them as some contaminants of this survey but binary quasars are also interesting I, actually we have find a few in the ongoing survey of high ratio lenses i mean uh I'm, I'm working on a paper based on that we, we find uh a few i mean maybe a few of them are still candidates at ratio of around five i mean they are uh but either binaries or lenses. And I think I will have more updates in the near future. Uh, yeah, I'm still checking the chat. Template images. Okay, Minhao. Uh, yeah. 
Thank you very much once again. Yeah, uh, thank you. And now we are moving to discussion likely on deep drilling fields, uh, multivalent follow-up and complementary surveys. So <clears throat> I see Dan is here also. So I propose to, to continue a uh, very interesting discussion from this morning. So uh, um, Gordon uh, put on the, on the Slack some, some uh, points. So uh, then uh, Gordon, would you like to, to, to start with? With questions or? Or Neil? Yeah, sure. sure, I'm happy to put up, put up the uh... The, the cadence node and we can chat about it from that perspective too, but I'm very flexible in how we do it. Yeah, so, I mean, I don't think uh, it matters exactly how I'll put, um, I posted things onto Slack, so let me put them in the, in the chat. I'll see um, if I can share, share the EGN thing as well. So I guess I can't, um, I don't know why, but I can't actually cut and paste to or from the chat. So you'll have to deal with the Slack. Um, but you know, if, if Dan is there, um, maybe we can just go through um, a couple of these things and we can reference um, Neil's white paper um, at, the, at the appropriate time. Sure. Um, Okay, so I mean, the first thing I think, uh, Neil, that we you know sort of talked about, which is the the time budget, right? And you know, through Dan being surprised yeah. that we're asking for so little, and mm -hmm. I, I think I think there's nothing to read into that, right? Other than I I, I I I would agree with that. Yeah. In fact, so here here is the cadence note, and I mean, one of the things we recommend here, and I've I've sort of highlighted some of the key things, but you know, we want substantial investments of time. An aggressive, aggressive investment of exposure in DDF. So I think we're all on board there. Um, we have certain ideas of things we want done, but but certainly there's agreement that we want, you know, aggressive investment in the deep drilling fields. Okay. Go ahead, Gordon. You have another point. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then. Um, so the next thing was uh, season length. Uh, yep. and I said, you know, we would also prefer long seasons, at least to the extent that the um, resulting um, DCR information is made available and that longer seasons don't have a negative impact on the depth due to higher mass observations. Right. Yeah, well, th th that, that second point is going to be one, one of the challenging ones. And I guess Amanda's no longer here, but... Um, this 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 tension between going really deep in the integrated full ten year depth and the um, the desire to have you know good time domain is what led to this possible uh, consideration of um, accordion cadences as one possibility to recover some of the the depth that's being lost by putting emphasis on the very long seasons. Um, whilst it, it, it's an attempt to kind of go halfway. And have, have you all heard any feedback about the accordion idea? Like whether, like from the right. project so about? I, I heard from Jelko. Um, so, so Jelko did confirm he'd, he'd read the white paper or the, the cadence note and he, he expressed interest in this and, and, and thanked us for putting forward this as a possibility. Um, Okay, yeah, I'll make yeah, sure to help push because yeah, I'm very interested in this idea too. Yeah, just... I'm, I'm happy to chat about. That. I, I personally, um, again, all of the all of the people who I was hearing from were really extremely keen about the time domain aspects, and, and I even raised deliberately on a few of our telecons. Is there anybody out there who is, um, you know, getting upset that the deep drilling fields are not satisfying their ultimate potential in, in, in depth? and heard rather little. Um, now, it was interesting in, in the chat earlier today, I saw Amanda, for example, was, was actually significantly concerned about this. And so I, um, I, I do think we'll wanna consider what the Galaxies folks have to say from, from their perspective. 
and, and the, the accordion cadence was, was an attempt to keep great time domain while also trying to drive the depth up some more. Um, and, and the depth hits you take are, are pretty substantial. Um, our, our assessments uh, it, it, across GRIZY is you were falling something like 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 0 0.6, 0 0.5, 0 0.4 mag shallower than you would have expected if you had done all the observations in an optimized way for depth. So oh, in you're the, taking, a subs, taking a substantial hit on the depth. Go ahead. I'm sorry. In that, in that case, you're, you're only a few tenths of a magnitude deeper, at least in, in G and U, U and G, than, uh, than uh, fast wide deep. Uh, perhaps, yeah, that, that yeah. could well be. Right. Yeah. I think, I mean, the number I keep in mind is that the, deep, the nominal deep drilling field depth is about a magnitude deeper than, um, than, than the wide, wide fast deep. And so yeah. if, you're, if you're now 0.7 uh, magnitudes um, shallower than your, your okay. you know, well, the, increment, yeah. the increment is small. Um, I, an right. interesting now, question. That, 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 Mike, Michael, that does, that does assume that, that you're, you're doing everything for wide, fast, deep in the fully optimized way of right, able right, to right, a gel right. growth space. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. I mean, what, a, a, a question where, you know, everyone wants everything, of course, but uh, a question is whether each deep, deep drilling field uh, be this, be the same in this regard? Can we imagine right. doing different things in different in different areas? And yeah, I very uh, much question, also want to know what you guys think about that. I'm sorry. Yes, I very much want to know your guys' answer to that question. So yeah, that's a AGN question. And again, Menda, if Menda's not here, it's it would be interesting to hear whether what what the push is. Uh, certainly, the science case for going very deep in galaxy counts, for example, over substantial areas is, is good. Does, do that, do us want to want to go uniformly deep in all five deep drilling fields, for example? That is a question whose answer I, uh, I don't know. Does one need 50 square degrees of, of that depth or is 10 square degrees plenty good enough for any science case that one can imagine? Right. Yeah. I don't, don't have a full answer there. I mean, I, I would say this, Michael, there, there are certain minimum requirements that I think the AGN people will start to get very unhappy if, if they're not met. Mm -hmm. um, but pro provided those minimum requirements are, are met, then you could imagine if you're going beyond that, and, and it sounds like from what the dark energy folks want, we probably will be going substantially beyond that, then you could actually vary things a fair amount beyond that. Right. Um, so provided you set a, satisfy these, these minimum requirements that I can go through what some of those might be, uh, th then, then I think, uh, at least from what I'm aware of, people would probably be okay. I mean, for, for example, I'll, 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 give you, I'll give you one example quickly. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we talk, and, and Dan talked about this idea of, I think he called them rolling uh, deep fields. And, and we talked about a very similar thing. Um, for example, if, if someone wanted to say, well, I don't really want to maintain these long seasons for the full 10 years. I only want to do the really long seasons for a few of the years. That might start to cause problems. Uh, from the perspective of people who want to get long-term quality light curves, well, for a variety of reasons, for example, for complementing reverberation mapping. So starting to deviate too far from that would start to be problematic. And then, of course, the question is, over those long seasons, how much time domain do you have to retain? And what we suggested in this white paper is that you could try to have four years with, with quite dense monitoring um, to, to, for example, allow accretion disk reverberation mapping and things like that, while the other six years could have less dense monitoring, but still every four to five nights. So, so that's a kind of minimum requirement. And I, I think if we started to get too far beyond that, people would start to get unhappy. And anyway, that's one example. Is, is that answering your, your question, Michael, or giving an example at least? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yep. Go ahead, Dan. I think you had something to say here. Oh, yeah, no, that this, yeah, this is good. So, so the, the the thing that you won't budge from is making sure that the long seasons are captured but we, we want well, yeah mm -hmm. yeah okay all right that's that's very useful with and, with and, decent and the long seasons with, with, can, go ahead and the long seasons can oh. be captured with the accordion they can be captured with the accordion that's right okay. um now and the the the, the the accordion that, that again yeah that, that we talked about is specified here that you would have a, a dense part of the accordion, a, a nightly monitoring part in GRIZY. And that accordion has to be at least two and a half months in duration. If you start to make it shorter than that, 
then accretion disk reverberation mapping studies start to suffer. So there's a, there, you, you can't say, I only want the accordion to be two weeks long. That isn't going to work. It has to be long enough that you can reverberation map accretion disks. And then the less dense part of the accordion, again, you can't start to make that so sparse that things fall apart. We, we said every four nights. And I suspect from supernova perspectives, you guys want something fairly similar to that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I imagine you'd, you'd get pretty unhappy if you started to go a lot less That's than right. every four yeah. nights. So it sounds, I mean, to, to my mind, it sounds like we have a lot of points of agreement. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I would jump in, you know, and, and Franz is, I, I think, um, suggesting that you know he would be okay with the EDS being different, and I think so as well. I, I think, I mean, there are certainly some aspects for AGNs where the baseline plan for LSST is already better than we would have ever, you know, dreamed to, you know, to come up with, right? So, um, yeah. if, if that meant, you know, we lost one 10 square degree field, or not even lost, but just could only do one type of science in one DDF uh, in exchange for doing some other science in another DDF. Uh, I think you'd find a lot of people agreeable uh, to that. Um, maybe Again, the, 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 pro 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 provided certain minimal requirements are met, yes. I mean, the reverberation, well, okay. the, 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 spec the spectroscopic reverberation mapping people are to get, get to be very unhappy if you say, I want to go sparser than every four nights, or that I want to just entirely skip a field for two years in a row. Things like well, that okay. won't work. I, 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 I don't entirely agree in the sense that, like, if we were to add, like, two new DDFs that nobody was, was, was planning on, then, you know, we could say, well, yeah, there could be two DDFs that you can't do PRM for, right? Um, but otherwise, yeah, I mean, you know, meeting some baseline requirement for at least the DDS that everybody was planning on. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so, so uh, maybe this is a good time to bring up uh, the, the, the cadence um, in terms of like the accordion. So, so we have some maths and some simulations that I think, you know, can, can help argue that extreme rolling cadences are bad, right? Like if we, if we look at like you know the, the the rolling cadences that produce the highest number of supernovae, for example, I mean that's those are terrible for AGNs. Um, but some type of rolling cadence is probably beneficial for almost all of us in the sense that you know it would be nice to have some small um, small uh, time samplings. Uh, roughly speaking, I would say you know what we kind of benefit from is uniform distribution and log delta T, right? Um, so, so one of the things that happens with something like a rolling cadence is you, for example, would get like a lot of observations with delta T at a thousand days, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, we already have too many observations at, at delta T of a thousand days, and so we don't need more, right? Um, but if we could, you know, somehow trade some of those for observations at delta T of a day, um, that would be great. So mm -hmm. let people comment. Do I take that as agreement or? Okay. Yeah, a couple of people yeah. are agreeing in the in the chat. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, so that, that would be my takeaway is that we're not scared of rolling cadences necessarily, um, but, you know, we're scared of certain types of rolling uh, cadences, perhaps. Yeah. Yep, I would agree with that. Um, I, I, I wanted to ask Dan another question quickly. Um, I would have thought that, that we would be hearing more from the transient folks uh, about the deep drilling fields. I mean, from, from your comments, you know, this morning, it, it sounded like, you know, the main people that you've heard from are, are the AGN people. And certainly the main people we've heard over here on the AGN side are the dark energy people. Um, I've always been surprised, for example, that the transients folks didn't have their own white paper put in on what they want for the deep drilling fields. I would have thought they would want kind of what Gordon was saying, you know, to explore a very wide range of time scales, perhaps to have you know, some period where you, you, you had an extremely dense sampling to explore very short time scales very well. But I've heard almost nothing on the yeah, detail. Yeah, Have yeah. you heard anything? 
I haven't heard that much. I think this is just because TBS is so broad that uh, and everyone has such different science cases. But I, I, I do think I have there was one paper that was pushing for kind of at least one field with very good cadence. So even better than the nominal DDF. Um, mm -hmm. So that was I think that's the only thing I heard. OK. But some kind, yeah, doing some kind of rolling thing where one field is pushed, um, yeah, I think that would satisfy that. But that, but it was okay. just like you know every day rather than like even multiple, not like multiple times a night, as far as I remember. Right, right. Okay. Well, if if you were to do the accordion that, that we've put forward, that would that would already automatically satisfy that. That's what we're asking for is the accordion. I mean, the dense yeah. part of the accordion is denser <laughs> than, than what right. we asked for previously, and, and then it's sparser in the outer parts. Right. So you actually get to the nightly monitoring there. But I, I mean, I, I'm just, uh, I had wondered whether anyone out there was pushing for, you know, I want to hit the deep relief fields every hour for, for you know, yeah, a no, period of a couple of weeks or something. I haven't heard much. Uh, people have, I mean, certainly one idea that's out there is, as it were, for a single deep drilling field for a single night, uh, go into what's called movie mode, which is you just observe. Yeah. Continuously uh, for AG, I mean, who knows what one would find with AGN, uh, but this is this is very much a let's go see what we might find uh, experiment rather than a, a specific uh, driver there. Yes, I remember Eric Feigelson had a white paper in. Eric Feigelson here at Penn State had a white paper in right. um, uh, for, for for exactly that kind of thing. I can't remember if it was a, for a galactic field or an extra galactic field, but it seems like it's something that's worth doing just so you can say yes, we've explored discovery space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and it's again as it's been phrased, it's let's take a single field and a single filter for a single night, and just uh, just do that all night, uh, and see what see what we find. Yeah, um, I, I have another question for Dan, um, I, Gordon. If you have uh, some sort of a schedule you're following, I don't want to throw it in, uh, upside down, but I do have another question for Dan. While no, we I mean I'll make sure that we get back on track. Um, I do see okay. that Mauricio um, and, and Franz have comments in the chat that I don't know if they want to. Okay. We should get to those too. Okay. Would you, should we do those first? I'm, I'm flexible. Um, well, why don't you go ahead, Neil, unless they're going to jump in. Oh, oh, okay, fine. Well, then, then I'll, I'll just quickly. So, so one, one other question, and, and this is going back to your points on, on filter balance, Dan. Um, so what we originally asked for was a filter balance, you know, like, like this, uh, U-G-R-I-Z-Y. You know, and these are 30 second visits. Uh, so every two nights you'd have four, one, one, three, five, four. Now, of course the U band can't be done in full time domain mode. So that would have some other time domain aspects which still aren't fully settled, but, but at least for GRIZY, one, one, three, five, four. Now, if I recall the general preference of the dark energy folks was less dense time domain, but a lot deeper, especially in the red bands. And that's what you said this morning still, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it kind of, if the cadence is really good, then then going deeper per night versus having better cadence, it kind of ends up a bit of a wash. So I think we've, we've, we're have we've we changing our thinking a little bit. And I, I also think, so in, in our first note, we were saying we didn't like why so much. And now people are trying to say why is very important. So we're kind of having our own internal battles, but uh, I, this kind of scaling that you're showing might not be far off from what we would like. It's it's the, the U-band question, I think, is the biggest question. Yeah. And I, I don't know the answer to U-band at all. But but yeah, the, the, these, okay, well, it, that, that's very promising. I mean, it sounds like this filter balance, you know, at least we're not worlds apart. Um, right. I, I remember you guys originally wanted, I mean, just insane amounts of time in like Z, if I recall. Yeah, we might have, want to see a run with an insane amount of time and why, but yeah, the, yeah, we're, we're actually starting to get a little closer to what you asked for. Okay, and, and so, and it sounds like you're actually, if I heard correctly, you're amenable to shifting a little bit more toward or faster time domain and, and sacrificing a little bit on the depth per epoch. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's wonderful. So. That's wonderful. Okay, good. Go yeah. ahead. I, I feel, why don't we go to some of these other questions in the chat window and with people's hands being raised? Roberto would like to say something. Roberto. Uh, yeah, no, actually, just 
very much on the same line. If you, you mentioned about this idea of decoupling the U band, uh, so I wonder if you could actually go more in detail to actually what you have in mind uh, there. I, I think the question is to uh, about using it like during bright time or and if not that at least uh just just once a month just going really deep in you but it's just you're you're hitting with griz you know every couple nights or whatever so i mean you you get hit badly in bright time but so if, if not that just yeah just just going as so going to the depth that you want but it's all one night a month Well, the U filters will only be in for a limited amount of time per month, because we have uh, six filters and five filter filter slots in the in filter exchange, uh, and so the U band will be mostly on uh, in the nights around the new moon, and uh, taken out uh, so that the Y band can be in for for the rest of the month. Yeah. That's the Okay, so yeah, kind of what I was mentioning a little bit was that uh, because our sources are variable, right, in the U band, uh, particularly when you're looking at a lower luminosity sources, uh, it can actually, the SED can start changing significantly in south those time scales. Mm -hmm. Probably a month might not be too detrimental. I would guess, but uh, I mean, the, it will affect you more towards the lower luminosity objects. Uh, by far, and you know, that's yeah, that's the that's the concern. But probably a month might not be too too much. I guess Roberta, your I mean, your main concern, and so Dan, I should say, you know, we have we do have mass uh, addressing this and, and and cadence notes, right? So we can, you know, fairly easily you know test uh, some some scenarios, right? Um, and and these are things that Roberta's actually written. Um, I mean, I think the main interest is just trying to match the SED uh, to the to the extent possible, and in that sense, like you know, as deep as we can, you know, once a month, as opposed to spread out over time, is probably fine, right? And if you were to ask me, at least, I would, you know, I would trade that um, the 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 U band um, cadence for GRI. Um, if we could get you know, really short uh, time separate samplings for GRI in, in, in exchange for uh, the U band, that would be fine. Um, so I, I, I think we would be flexible there. Um, but it starts being it would start to be painful if we're not achieving a certain depth. Is that is that accurate, Roberto? Yeah, I think that's that's fair. Uh, in the end, yeah, you just you want to balance the going as deep as possible with trying to not. Uh, yeah, trying to get a, a sampling that is not way well. Trying to not get time differences that are too long between all the other bands. Uh, but I think that's uh, fair. Uh, we do want to go as deep as possible, and it seems like this might be the the best way to to do it. So Maurizio would like to ask something. Yeah, just to pick up on. Uh one of the comment. Uh, I, I didn't understand if there was some uh, options uh, uh, proposed to drop part of the baseline on the deep drilling fields, so not to observe them for the full 10 years. Because I thought this was one of the minimum requirements that we wanted. Maybe we can, uh, as we discussed, change the cadence during the survey. But uh, mm, for doing both detection for the work that the Metra has shown sometimes about the detection capabilities through variability and to study, for instance, the structure function and uh, finding the bands uh, in the structure function to correlate to black hole mass or to uh, look at reverberation from dust, you need a long time scale. Now, it yeah. is true that you will go, you can do that on the, on the wide survey, of course, with lesser cadence, but it's also true that the deep drilling field have the advantage that you can stack epochs and so go much deeper. Uh, mm -hmm. So basically you transform the cadence in depth. Yep. So, so, that, so, so at, at least from what the AGN people have said in our most recent cadence note, 
um, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't boldface this, but, but it's right here. Uh, we want the full, we want observations of the deep drilling fields every year for the full 10 years. Now, some of those years may be very dense, other years may be less dense, but there's a certain minimum requirement of about every four to five nights. And if you start getting sparser than that, I think, as you've just said, people would start to get unhappy. And so, and, and then moreover, the other requirement listed that we put in the white paper is you have to maintain the long season, seven to eight and a half months for the full 10 years. Those were the things that we put forward in our white paper. And as far as I'm aware, we still stand by those. But go, go ahead. I, I think Franz and, and Dan may have some reactions here. Yeah. Just, just a comment on Maurizio's um, question. And so they're actually, at the moment, the way things are structured, you need some observations each year to build templates because the templates are built every year for difference imaging the next year. Um, and that's to do with not having too many alerts from proper motions from stars and, and whatnot. Um, and so at the moment, it's spec something like there's a minimum of 20% that needs, you know, 20% of the, the full, if you just divide whatever 10,000 um, visits by 10 years, you know, 1,000 visits per year, I think the minimum you need is of the order of 100 or 200 to get decent seeing in, a, in the bands to combine to do the difference imaging, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't think you can have extreme rolling cadences that are breaking away from that minimum requirement. That's good to hear. Makes us happy. Uh, any, any thoughts, Dan, on, on these kind of minimum requirements? Do you see any reason why yeah. those minimum requirements would be objectionable? No, I think I think yeah, that's totally this should totally be fine because your your four to five nights is is half the cadence for, from your kind of baseline request. Yeah. So if you're already kind of on low end, you know that's really not not a big ask of the system. So okay. Uh, I, I, yes, I, I think that's definitely doable. Okay. I, yeah. Uh, do you have something else, Franz? Your, your hand's up still. I want to make sure. No. Okay. Uh, now there's a lot of great stuff going by in the chat window, which I have not been able to digest, but is there anything there that people want to raise that somehow hasn't come out already? I haven't had a chance to read all these. So, so my original point was the DDFs do not need to be uniform. And so mm -hmm. we, we very much could consider test cases for each DDF probing a different parameter space. And this may be scientifically interesting, but also it will, it will have some potential repercussions on how we interpret the wide fast D. Mm -hmm. And so we may want to think about how, how we can use those test cases to best leverage our understanding of, of the incompleteness in various parameters for wide fast yep. deep, right? And if, yeah. we, if, yeah, we yeah. Focus I, yeah, one, yep. if we focus on one particular thing for all five of them, we may run into the problem that by year five, we're like, oh, we didn't think about this. And we have, right. you know, big incompletenesses for some, some areas. Yeah, I have to say, yeah, my, my so, so this cadence note here was um, written kind of in a defensive way saying, here's what we've asked for back in 2018, and now we're going to keep defending it and, and explain why th this is still a good idea in its essence. And here's a few possible tweaks to it. But, but as you say, Franz, I was not here trying to go off and explore lots of other possibilities. I was trying to say, here's a set of certain minimum requirements that we think you really have to do. And if you want to go and do additional exploratory things on top of that, provided these minimum requirements are met, I think that could be a very good thing to do, provided the project is willing to invest the, the time to do it. Fully, yeah. fully agree. Yeah. yeah. So provided you sat, satisfy these minimum requirements, great. Go ahead and explore beyond that. You can throw as much time as you want into the deep drilling fields. I'll, I yeah. won't stop you. I, I guess <laughs> um, I would take a slightly different tack than what you, your last two sentences. And okay. I wouldn't put it on somebody else to say, go and explore. I would say, what do we actually need? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what, what are our suggestions about how we would explore? Well, what, 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 well, let's see. I mean, the, the one thing that immediately comes to mind is, is, is doing that movie mode experiment 
which is a pretty cheap experiment to do and, and does is valuable for doing uh, discovery space. So I think that's definitely something that should be done. I, I had thought about putting that in the white paper, but it was already getting very complicated. And so I, I didn't put it in. Um, do, you have, yeah. do you have thoughts? Do, 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 well, do you or do others have thoughts on additional things on top of the minimum requirements here that we should be off exploring? So, I mean, so one is- You, you must is have just some ideas, from Extreme depth, right? right? Uh -huh. and, and so if you push for high cadence, you don't get extreme depth as you showed in your in your yep. cadence note. And so you could have one field which has a more narrow cadence and goes for depth, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you could even cherry pick the best nights and, and you know, best seeing and, and, and whatnot. Yep. The moon, um, yeah, the moon, the moon, yeah. Yeah, so you could you know, focus one particularly on that and then you could focus one on a very, very high cadence over a very long period, very long, baseline or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't have, I'm not advocating for anything in particular. It's just that we should think about it and particularly in how we want to calibrate the wide fast deep, I think is, is very relevant here. How we want to do the, the incomplete, you know, incompleteness or completeness corrections, um, how we want to understand the underlying population to then model back what we get out of wide fast deep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with that. Certainly, right. So, it's sort of extreme depth. Um, you know, where Franz, I might break that up into you know extreme depth in a in like the RI band, and then you know something where we have extreme depth in, in say like the U band, right? Um, uh, so we can probe things there. And then you know the movie mode that we were that we were talking about is the other thing that I would I would bring up in terms of you know. Um, time domain uh, physics, right? So as, as noted um, on Monday, really Kepler and TESS aren't, aren't very useful for short time scale variability, despite the fact that it, it seems like they, they they should be, right? Um, so mm -hmm. that would be great if LSSC could promote those. Another, another potential area is single visit, well, yeah, I guess single single day or night depth. And so you could imagine doubling up the exposures in a three hour window to go a little bit deeper in, a, in an individual epoch, right? Um, and of course you would get the small variability as well, but you could stack those and, and push a little bit deeper. And again, that would be to understand the one big problem and fundamental limitation of the DDFs is that they still are 30 second exposures. And so they're not really giving you the completeness correction on individual exposures in the wide fast deep. And this also plays to, I think, Dan, you are interested in going deeper for supernova in the DDFs. And so this also may be able to push deeper supernova searches, at least in one DDF, for instance. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so if there's nothing um, more there, maybe uh, we can move on to a I, couple I, other things. Well, I, I have a couple more things, but, but Gordon, if you have some more things in your notes, uh, that's great. I have a couple more things uh, here quickly. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, uh, well, I'll, I'll just, yeah, I'll, I'll mention, ahead. you know, two, two more and then we can see. So, um, you know, Dan mentioned uh, dithers. Um, I, I think ah, we can yeah, agree on yeah. that. Everybody yep. wants small dithers. I, that's in here. Yeah, that's Unless right. That's what we want to. Yep, I, uh, that's right here. Whatever dithering pattern, uh, you know, we're worried about dithering so far, you go off where the prime multi-wavelength data are. We, we don't want that. And we want the dithers kept as small as reasonably possible. So it yeah, the sounded question like of, we have of, good agreement there. Go ahead. The question, the question of what is reasonable is a question of how well and how, uh, you can calibrate, how well do you need to calibrate? There are issues yeah. of sky subtraction and flat fielding and so on for which Overly small dithers will be problematic, um, but I don't think we yeah. know enough about the camera performance to even make a, an ex explicit recommendation there. Just to point out can, that can you can you be a TBD. little bit quantitative, Michael? Uh, could you be a little bit quantitative on what what might start to become too small? Uh, that's exactly the problem. That that no, there okay. is not a good answer to that yeah. question. Yeah. It'll okay. depend yeah. on okay. scattered light properties and non uniformities in the detectors and stuff like that. As Franz points out, yeah, um, rotational mean, dithers are part of the story as well. 
I, th I think maybe we can phrase it as we want the smallest dithers possible that aren't having effects that we have failed to, you know, understand. Yeah, something like that, right. But <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it sounds like, so Dan, you, you agree, you agree basically with, with, with these highlighted points there, right? Yep, I do. Okay, great. So that's very promising. Okay, go ahead, Gord. You have another one, I guess. Okay. Uh, and then on the number of fields, I mean, I, just speaking for myself, uh, yeah. people can chime in. I don't think there's any objection to more fields uh, other than, you know, the fact that they're all clumped together and that, you know, um, one may be stealing time uh, from, from the other, but uh, certainly more time, yeah, it's consistent with more time spent on the DDS, which I don't know that any of us would really truly complain about. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I'll just say that the the Akari deep field that, that Dan, you know, had mentioned uh, sounds sounds like a sensible thing to me as well. Clearly, there will have to be further efforts made to build up the multi wavelength data in that field. Um, I think some of that will come along, uh, but I mean, I, I I think that's reasonable. I, I'll also say just from the the longer term perspective, I've always I was surprised that in the white paper process there were not even more deep fields being put out there. Um, Michael probably will remember that back a decade ago or more, you know, people, like Tony Tyson was talking about having 30 deep drilling fields and it, that just didn't turn out to be reality um, or anywhere close to it. Um, so I might, Dan, are you aware of any push for additional deep drilling fields? I mean, if you had the four that are already announced plus the Akari deep field, it sounds like you all would be happy. Have you, are you aware of anyone there's probably so you know you know galactic fields and things like that, but but yeah, I'm not I've not heard other... any that are like these these deep five deep drilling fields. So no. Yeah, is any is anyone have any additional points on that? I, I've always been surprised that there weren't uh, more. Yeah, a, 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 as Franz is saying, there's a few mini mini DDF galactic fields which I'm aware of, but that that was about it. Okay, so it sounds like. We're pretty converged on that. I mean, I would be, I mean, I think, I think we would be happy having four or five. And it sounds like that's what the dark energy folks like. So it sounds promising from that perspective. Okay. And I mean, the last thing I had was just uh, Wei Zhang's note about single epic uh, depths and, um, and, you know, the lunar illumination. Um, but yep. I, I don't know that that's a, constraint of that's just that's just, it's just we know what it is right so yeah it is what it is it, it, there is this uh nielsen e nielsen at l2021 ruben technical note 14 which has a very valuable discussion on on the lunar effects and pretty much we defer to what they say and ask them to try to observe the deep drilling field to the best of their ability when the moon is down beyond that i don't know how much more there is that can be said at this point did you guys have any further thoughts on this, Dan? Did you do anything further on this point? We tried doing something in the in our, our first note, not not the recent round, but yeah, we didn't we didn't go back to it. We felt we feel like this is something that we haven't explored enough. Okay. Yeah, we just deferred to this 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 Ruben technical note fourteen, and yeah, clearly we'll be happy to work with these people as they inform us as to what they can practically do and not do. Anything else, Gordon? I, I have a couple of other, other things, but if there, no, okay, yeah. I have a couple of, so, so, so I was very intrigued, Dan, by, by your, your mention of trying to coordinate with uh, Euclid, for example, actually, you know, near simultaneous or simultaneous observation. And, and we actually like that a lot too. Um, there, there was the officially submitted uh, cadence note, and then I realized, oh, there's this additional thing we should have added in. So. I actually, Franz knows about this. I sent a second cadence note in with that added this additional paragraph, but essentially we, um, we recommend that Ruben make efforts to obtain simultaneous or near simultaneous observations of the DDFs at the times they're being observed by Euclid or Roman. Um, so from the AGN perspective, that can help us with photometric redshifts. And it's not, yeah, good. So, so it sounds like your thumbs up too. So we're all pushing in the same direction there, which is great. I think I think the trick is going to be aligning the um, rolling cadence with the Euclid creep up in declination because they're going to start mm -hmm. at low declination and then creep up towards the equatorial and then move over to the northern fields over their five year mission. And so mm -hmm. we need 
LSST will need to plan to hit the southernmost portion in, I guess, year two to try and do that. Um, but there may be a fundamental limitation because year one is going to be the whole sky. Okay. We can't do, we can't start rolling cadence until. Yeah. Actually, yeah, you like have to get the whole sky. Yeah. One year, 1. 1.5, um, right. basically. And that's due to, um, we just need to get a, a huge baseline for the, um, the parallax. Okay. Great. And, so, and then, Neil, I mean, the other, oh, please go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, I guess an issue with Euclid is, you know, what we've talked about before um, in terms of the photo Z and, and sort of joint processing, right? So, um, I mean, it only does us so much good for the data to be there if it's not easily uh, used in the LSST context, right? So, so you know, mm -hmm. what's the plan there? Well, yeah, that, 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 funding. that that's it's Fr 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 comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Franz can comment on that. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, uh, you're, we're writing you're, you're a on, recommendation. Yeah. We're writing a recommendation yeah. and it will come down to if it's funded or not. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> we have a, a couple of minutes of left. So, okay. We should. And we should well, close. I'll, I'll wrap up. This, this is my final one. This is my final one. And that, that okay. Think, so th the other one I just wanted to mention to Dan that, that we are keen about on the EGN side is there are these other large uh, monitoring projects, spectroscopic reverberation mapping in particular, um, being done by Sloan 5 and then by, by Foremost. And so there will be certain years uh, of these spectroscopic reverberation mapping campaigns um, when they will be doing their dense spectroscopic monitoring. And, and we, would, we would like um, for the dense Rubin photometric monitoring to coincide with the specific years when the dense spectroscopic monitoring is going on. Um, oh, yeah, hopefully we, that's a possibility, but, but go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know about this, but we would love that too, as long as there's extra fibers that, that, that are part of the program that can be stuck on supernovae. Oh, can uh, be stuck on supernovae, uh, ah, okay. Yeah. I'm pretty sure besides that, there's already a foremost program for that. Okay, yeah, yeah, right. I know Mark yeah. Sullivan has has exactly. Said that. So, but I, yeah, but yeah I agree we, about the the timing. Do we have any foremost people on right now? Or no? Guess not. Okay, fine. Very, very few. I mean, eventually in six months, I might be a part of the team, but uh, at the moment, I'm not formally part of the team. But uh, fine. Okay. Yeah, so, so they. they uh, Okay. Sorry. We have construction people working here right outside our, our apartment. Okay. Um, okay. No, so, uh, so. Sorry, I am foremost, but I do not know. I don't really understand what is the question here. Mara here speaking, by the way. Um, I, I think the so question I, 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 is, is what besides project doing with supernovae in the deep drilling fields? And is that coordinated with, you know, is that simultaneous with the AGN? I, I think so. I think they've got it. I think so they, they, they are all simultaneous, right? Because we have to submit all the targets uh, and they are all uh, going to be done at the same time. Well, the TIDES has a specific deep component. So TIDES isn't only uh, uh, sort of across the full survey footprint. Yeah. Yeah, I can look okay. for the information if you want. <clears throat> okay. Well, okay. That's everything I have. Are, are, are do other people have anything? I mean, to my mind overall, this seems very promising. You know, we, we have some places where we might disagree a little bit, but overall, it sounds like you know, th there there is a solution here that will be very good for everybody. Yes. Okay. You, uh, you, you, so, yeah. Good. So oh, Dan so, has something. I, I'm sorry that we, we have one minute more. One minute okay. more. Yep. So um, I, I invite uh, Neil to, to give some concluding remarks or something like, and we will finish with, with workshop. I, I, I think okay. I, I would like to thank to, to all speakers today. And also I think uh, uh, really it was very interesting for me and hope for other participants. And then uh, Neil, please. Yeah, no, I, I, I would echo that. I, I think it's been a, a, a good success. I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased that the quality of the talks was uniformly great. Um, I thought it was very exciting. And I think each day was, was long enough to have a good substance to it uh, without getting so long that your eyes glaze over and, and you get uh, your mind wanders and you start checking your email. And, and so um, overall, I, I was very pleased. And so 
uh, thinking toward toward the future, um, I think we could actually do these every year. You know, given that the AGNSC has limited funding, it's going to be challenging to get people to fly all over the world. You know, to go to a meeting, and we probably couldn't afford a meeting hall and such anyway. But um, hopefully, we can have these every year. So, so let me ask. Uh, we can just do a quick thumbs up or whatever with the emojis. Would people like to consider doing one of these again next year? Were people pleased? And, and would you like one next year? Okay, I'm seeing lots of thumbs up. Okay, great. Okay, well, that works for me. Okay. And, and if anyone has any constructive suggestions for future years, then um, we could, you know, you know, cl clearly think about it. And, and we're very flexible at exactly how you do it. But, but this is a, okay. And so, um, great. Uh, anything else from anyone? Um, anyway, th thank you everyone for, for participating. I, it's been a great pleasure. And um, clearly we'll, we'll all be in touch. Well, thanks Neil, just to, to, go ahead. Just thanks to, to thank you for rearranging this and pushing it, you know, uh, again, it's uh, fantastic that we were able to do it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it, it came together. Uh, it came together. Uh, much better than I was expecting in terms of the number of people interested and uh, talk quality and the variety of talks. It was, it was great. So, and again, thanks to, of course, to all the other organizers as well who put in a lot of efforts. So, thank you. That we finished. <laughs> okay, so I, I guess we're done. Uh, take care, everyone. Um, safe travels home. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.